This video is brought to you by Audible. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one audiobook, two Audible originals, absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash brainfood or text brainfood to 500-500. Now, I imagine you've probably heard of Audible because, well, you're on the internet, so I'm pretty sure you have. They have the largest selection of audiobooks in the world, bar none. Now, I'd love to do something a little bit different today and recommend an audiobook on Audible from us. A few years ago, before this channel actually got started, we released an audiobook answering some of the most commonly asked why questions on our website. The audiobook is called The Wise Book of Wise, and of course, it's available on Audible, and you can get it absolutely for free if you click the link below and sign up for Audible. By using that link below, you get a 30-day free trial, you get one free book, and of course, those two Audible originals, and you can make that free book our Wise Book of Wise. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be that audiobook. They've got a huge range on their platform. Maybe you're looking for something to inspire you this new year. I mean, personally, I listen to a lot of biographies of sort of the greats from history, and that really inspires me, motivates me to get things done. Also with Audible, if you don't like a book, you can exchange it. You also get to keep your books forever. You can also listen on any device. Audible is just the best. Get started with it today. Link below or at audible.com slash brainfood or text brainfood to 500 500 again audible.com slash brainfood or text brainfood to 500 500 and let's get into it in the video today we're answering a viewer question because panda guy 5 asks us were people ever really tortured in iron maidens the people of the Middle Ages have a reputation for wanton brutality, and as supposed evidence of this, countless instruments of torture sit in museums around the world, arguably the most famous of which is the Iron Maiden. This hellish contraption supposedly caused unthinkable pain and anguish for those unlucky enough to be sentenced to suffer its merciless sting, condemning them to a slow and agonizing death. Or at least that's what the stories say, because as far as anyone can tell, the Iron Maiden didn't exist as a real-world object until the 19th century. And for reference here, the so-called medieval times are generally considered to have ended around the end of the 15th century. So who invented the Iron Maiden, and how did it become the face of medieval torture, and has anyone ever actually been killed in one? As for historical examples, there are a couple of references to similar devices in history, with the oldest being a device known today as the Iron Apega, supposedly made about 2,200 years ago. Described by Greek historian Polybius, the device was an automaton replica of the wife of 2nd and 3rd century BC Spartan leader Nabus, with the woman in question named, you guessed it, Apega. The automaton was apparently lavishly dressed up in one of Apega's outfits, with Polybius then stating of those who were made to meet the wife replica. When the man offered her his hand, he made the woman rise from her chair and, taking her in his arms, drew her gradually to his bosom. Both her arms and hands, as well as her breasts, were covered with iron nails, so that when Nabus rested his hands on her back and then by means of certain springs drew her victim towards her, he made the man thus embraced say anything and everything. Indeed, by this means he killed a considerable number of those who denied him money. So, in a nutshell of the whole story, anyone who refused to pay their taxes would be made to give this mechanical version of his wife a hug, with, at any point, them being able to make the hug of death stop if they agreed to pay. If they did not, the hug continued until they died. Whether this device actually existed or not, or was just an allusion to Apega's supposedly ruthless nature to match the reported cruelty of her husband, isn't known. Moving on from there, we have an account from one of the earliest Christian authors and the so-called father of Latin Christianity, Tertullian, who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century AD. In his work, To the Martyrs, he states of the death of Roman general and consul Marcus Attilius Regulus, it would take me too long to enumerate one by one the men who at their own self-impulse have put an end to themselves. Regulus, a Roman general who had been taken prisoner by the Carthaginians, declined to be exchanged for a large number of Carthaginian captives, choosing rather to be given back to the enemy. He was crammed into a sort of chest and everywhere pierced by nails driven from the outside. He endured so many crucifixions. A follow-up account by Augustine of Hippo in his 5th century City of God elaborates on the tale of Regulus's death. 
Marcus Atilius Regulus, a Roman general, was a prisoner in the hands of the Carthaginians, but they, being more anxious to exchange their prisoners with the Romans than to keep them, sent Regulus as a special envoy with their own ambassadors to negotiate this exchange, but bound him first with an oath that if he failed to accomplish their wish, he would return to Carthage. He went and persuaded the Senate to the opposite course because he believed it was not for the advantage of the Roman Republic to make an exchange of prisoners. After he had thus exerted his influence, the Romans did not compel him to return to the enemy, but what he had sworn he voluntarily performed. But the Carthaginians put him to death with refined, elaborate, and horrible tortures. They shut him up in a narrow box in which he was compelled to stand, and in which finely sharpened nails were fixed all around about him, so that he could not lean upon any part of it without intense pain, and so they killed him by depriving him of sleep. That said, whether any of this actually happens or not is up for debate, as 1st century BC Greek historian Diodorus claims Regalus died of natural causes, with no mention of such a torture device involved. Moving on from there, there are old European fairy tales of unknown date and origin in which certain individuals were killed by being placed inside casks that had nails driven in. The cask would then apparently be rolled down a steep hill, sometimes into water, which, if we're being honest, almost sounds worse than an actual Iron Maiden. Sort of the spiked version of death by a thousand paper cuts, and then as a reward at the end, terrifying slow drowning as you writhe in agony from all the little holes in your body, no doubt also trying to reflexively break the cask to get out once it starts filling with water, creating some more holes in the process. We suppose at least this one's a bit quicker, if a lot more dramatic. Other than that, there are no references to such an Iron Maiden-like device until just before the 19th century. The first reference comes from German philosopher, linguist, archaeologist, and professor at the University of Altdorf, Johann Philipp Sebenkes, in 1793. According to Sebenkes, on August 14, 1515, a coin forger was sent to die in a casket that had metal spikes driven into various parts, lined up with particularly sensitive bits of the forger's anatomy. Right, Sebenkes, the very sharp points penetrated his arms and his legs in several places, and his belly and chest, and his bladder and the root of his member, penis, and his eyes and his shoulders and his buttocks, but not enough to kill him, and so he remains making great cry and lament for two days, after which he died. Of course, if this was a real method of execution used, each such cask would have had to have been custom spiked for each new victim in order to line everything up perfectly, given people come in all shapes and sizes. This creates something of a logistical problem that many other means of torturing and killing someone wouldn't have. Nevertheless, Sabankis claimed it happened at least this once. So did it. Well, given the complete lack of evidence or even reference to any other such Iron Maiden-like device used elsewhere in this era, nor who this forger was or any such pertinent details other than the oddly specific date, most historians think he made it up or that this was an exaggerated tale of the use of a device that we do know existed in Europe. So what was this real instrument of torture? Well, this was something called a shandmantel, coat of shame, the drunkard's cloak, or the Spanish mantle. It was essentially a wooden cask someone who was being punished for some crime would be made to wear about town, a sort of mobile version of stocks with a similar purpose, mocking someone publicly and having people throw random things at them, in this case, as they trudged along. Consider this account from Ralph Gardiner's 17th century England's Grievance Discovered. Men drove up and down the streets with a great tub or barrel opened in the sides with a hole in one end to put through their heads and to cover their shoulders and bodies down to the small of their legs, and then close the same, called the new-fashioned cloak, and so make them march to the view of all beholders, and this is their punishment for drunkards or the like. Jumping across the pond to the land of the free, at least some soldiers were not always free, as noted in an article titled A Look at the Federal Army, published in 1862, where the author states, I was extremely amused to see a rare specimen of Yankee invention in the shape of an original method of punishment drill. One wretched delinquent was gratuitously framed in oak, his head being thrust through a hole cut in one end of a barrel, and the other end of which had been removed, and the poor fellow loafed about in the most disconsolate manner, looking for all the world like a half-hatched chicken. In another account by one John Howard in 1784 in his The State of Prisons in England and Wales, he writes, 
Denmark. Some of the lower sort, as watchmen, coachmen, etc., are punished by being led through the city in what is called the Spanish mantle. This is a kind of heavy vest, something like a tub with an aperture for the head and irons to enclose the neck. I measured one at Berlin, 1 foot 8 inches in diameter at the top and 2 foot 11 inches at the bottom and 2 foot 11 inches in high. This mode of punishment is particularly dreaded and is one cause that night robberies are never heard of in Copenhagen. Of course, much like the Iron Maiden, as you'll note from the dates mentioned here, most detailed contemporary accounts of these devices of humiliation and sometimes torture seem to indicate they weren't really a medieval thing, despite sometimes being claimed to go back to the 13th century in Germany. In any event, whether Sibenki's much more elaborate cask with spikes put in was really just a tale he picked up that was exaggerating these coats of shame, he made it up completely, or whether some inventive executioner thought to add the addition of spikes to such a cask and a forger really was executed in this way in the 16th century isn't known, with most leaning towards Sibenki's making it up. Even if it did really happen, however, this still is post-medieval times by most people's reckoning. Whatever the case, a handful of years after Sibenki's account, the first known actual Iron Maiden appeared in a Nuremberg museum in 1802, not far away from Sibenki's home in Altdorf. This device was supposedly discovered in a German castle in the late 18th century. Not just a cask, this killing machine was roughly human-shaped, made of iron, and even had a face, supposedly based on the face of the Virgin Mary, hence the torture instrument's name, the Iron Maiden. This probably first real Iron Maiden was sadly destroyed during World War II by Allied bombers, but a copy created as decoration for the Gothic Hall of a patrician palace in Milan in 1828. From this copy, we can see that this device was certainly designed to cause unimaginable agony to its victims. Along with having strategically placed spikes designed to pierce approximately where a person's vital organs and sensitive nether region dangly bits are, the face of the maiden did indeed have spikes designed to pierce a victim's eyes upon closing, assuming the person wasn't vertically challenged. This copy did a lot to help popularize the idea of the Iron Maiden as a real thing thanks to its prominent display at the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago and subsequent tour across the United States to much fanfare. Incidentally, this was the same World's Fair that gave us the name Ferris Wheel for a device previously called a Pleasure Wheel, with George Washington Gale Ferris Jr.'s iconic version being rather massive compared to anything that had come before, holding an astounding 2,160 people at a time. This was also the same fair that saw famed serial killer H. H. Holmes taking advantage of the extra people in town looking for a place to stay, keeping business booming at his so-called House of Horrors Hotel. Going back to the Iron Maiden, beyond the tour of one of the originals and extra exposure at the World's Fair, another man largely credited with popularizing the idea of the Iron Maiden was 19th century art collector Matthew Peacock. Among other things, he managed to collect a wide variety of historic torture devices to, as he put it, show the dark spirit of the Middle Ages in contrast to the progress of humanity. You see, at the time it was on vogue to not just act like people from medieval times were all scientific rubes, which is where the myth that people in medieval times thought the world was flat came from, despite all evidence to the contrary, but also that they were extremely barbaric, with the Iron Maiden creating a rather nice illustration of this supposed fact. Naturally unable to find the real McCoy, Peacock cobbled together an Iron Maiden apparently partially from real artifacts or other means of torture, and then donated it to a museum to be displayed as a symbolic representation of the former era's cruelty. The public ate all of this up, and the idea of the Iron Maiden slowly permeated throughout society to the point that most today assume it was a real thing used to kill people in a slow and very painful way during medieval times. This all brings us to the question of whether anyone has actually ever been tortured or killed in one. The answer, surprisingly, is possibly, but not in medieval times, nor even apparently in historic ones, unless you consider a couple of decades ago historic. And this is where Uday Hussein enters the picture. The eldest son of Saddam started his murderous rampage apparently by bludgeoning to death one Kamal Gigo, who was at the time Saddam's bodyguard, valet, and food taster. The murder was done in front of a host of party guests in 1988. The party in question was in Egypt in honor of then Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak's wife, Suzanne. As to what Gio did to incite Uday's rage, he apparently hooked Saddam up with a woman, Samira Shabandar. Samira was married when Saddam met 
letter, but that was quickly taken care of, freeing him up to take her as one of his mistresses and later as his second wife. While still in the mistress stage, Uday decided to kill Jujio for the facilitation of Saddam's illicit relationship, which Uday seems to have felt was an affront to his own mother. Saddam did sentence his son to death for this murder, but a few months later switched to exiling him to Switzerland, with the Swiss government allowing the well-known recent murderer to enter the country for some bizarre reason. However, after frequent run-ins with the law there, the Swiss finally gave him the boot and returned him to Iraq without any apparent consequences. If all of that wasn't enough of a testament to what a swell fella this guy was, beyond some confirmed assassination attempts and other murders by the lovable rapscallion, rumors of frequent rape of random women swirled around Uday regularly. All of this brings us back to the Iron Maiden and Uday's eventual appointment as the chairman of the Iraqi Olympic Committee and the Iraq Football Association. In those positions, accusations were rampant that Uday occasionally had various athletes tortured when they were thought to have either underperformed or otherwise screwed up in some competition. These included doing things like ripping their toenails off, scalding their feet, subjecting them to extreme sleep deprivation, having them kick cement balls and dragged across gravel roads, followed by being dipped into sewage. Allegedly, after a 4-1 loss to Japan in the Asian Cup in 2000, he also had three of the players deemed responsible for the defeat beaten repeatedly for a few days. As for the Iron Maiden, after a day's death and the fall of Saddam's regime in 2003, a mere 20 or so meters away from the Iraqi Football Association headquarters, an Iron Maiden was found on the ground. Time magazine's Bobby Ghosh states of this find, the one found in Baghdad was clearly worn from use, its nails having lost some of their sharpness. It lay on its side within view of Uday's first floor offices in the soccer association. Ironically, the torture device was brought to Time's attention by a group of looters who had been stripping the compound of anything of value. They had left behind the Iron Maiden, believing it to be worthless. Then said, despite the report, there is no actual hard evidence the Iron Maiden was used, nor blood found on the device or the like. But given all the rumors of Uday's penchant for torturing people and some of the confirmed things he did do, as well as the device's location, at the least he is presumed to have used it as a method of terrorizing people, as was more than norm even in medieval times with actual real-world torture devices, rather than frequently using them. All that said, given his proclivities for murdering people who upset him, it is further speculated by many many that he might have actually followed through and killed someone with it at some point. But again, despite reports, so far there has never been any concrete evidence of this, so it's still not wholly clear if anyone was actually ever killed by Iron Maiden or not. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out another channel I do called Biographics. We actually did a video about Saddam Hussein, his sort of grim biography. Please find that linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.